I just want to say this. I thank God for all of you. Because, in, again, in those pictures of the people who, you know, a lot of you pour your lives into serving the Lord. And you feel that God has caused you to do it here in this congregation. There's lots of churches. There's a lot of congregations. The body of Christ is bigger than just this. But for those who feel that this is where God has placed them, thank you for pouring out your life and your heart and your time and your effort and your money and all those things. And I've said this, I said this uh, the other evening, you know, this isn't Pastor Carmen's church. People always say, well, it's Pastor Carmen's church. It's not, it's not that Pastor Carmen's church. Because someday Pastor Carmen ain't going to be here, you know. Whether God moves us or takes me home or whatever, someday, you know, and I'm praying for the next guy. I'm praying for the next guy. When we started this back in 1991, I didn't do it for me. You know, I didn't figure, I think, I think I'll start me a church, you know. Uh, but uh, Ephesians chapter 4, whenever we have a, a church anniversary, I always go to this uh, scripture because it's pretty much what we built on uh, from the very beginning. I know I've told this story, and some of you have heard it, and some of you haven't, uh, about how this church got started when we finished our internship in the Church of God back in 1991. Uh, the internship runs from like September to March or April. And we finished the internship, and I was working with Pastor Spencer over in Trenum, and uh, he called me up one day, and for those of you who knew Pastor Spencer, he called me up one day. He said, I need to talk with you. And I said, well, okay. I thought he was mad at me. So I said, well, what do you want to talk about? And he says, no, I need to see you. And so I said, said he, I know he's mad at me. So I went over there, and, and uh, he said, he told me, he says, they want to start a church in Monroeville, the Church of God. <clears throat> Stay off. They want to start a church in Monroeville. They were in a church planning type mode, and they that's Hargan and Monroeville. And they had a guy that was set to do it, and he backed out, and they're looking for somebody to start this church in Monroeville. And I said, yeah, Pastor Spencer said, would you and your wife be interested? And I said, well, we'll pray about it. He said, okay. So we did. We prayed about it for probably about 15 minutes, and uh, met a little bit longer than that. We said, okay, we'll do it. And I, I did not have a clue. I had no clue. And I want to tell you something. It's, this is like backwards, because usually when you hear about people starting churches and planting churches, they get a vision and they get a, a burden. You know, I didn't have any burden from Monroeville. I don't live in Monroeville. Uh, just the way it is. You know, well, they want to start a church. So Rose and I decided we, so yeah, well, sure, we'll do it. And uh, <laughs> uh, they had, this is what they did and what they were using back then. And again, I'm not, you know. They, they were using a telemarketing program to try to start a church. Anybody ever hear that? You know how you get a phone call and say, hello, you know, we're selling blah, blah, blah. Well, this is before they had the do not call list. They would get, uh, you know, a Coles, a Coles, what they would call a Coles directory. And uh, the guys from Pinal, they would use them. And they would call. And they called like every house in Monroeville. And they would say, you know, do you have a church? And they would say, if they would say, yes, we have a church, they would say, well, God bless you. Thank you. Have a you know, good day. If they would say no, they say, well, we're starting a church in Monroeville, blah, 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 blah. Garden, Garden City, Church of God. Yeah, yeah it's not, that's what it was called. And uh, they called all these, they, they probably called 17,000 houses in Monroeville. And uh, I had this sneaking suspicion that it wasn't going to work too well. <laughs> so when we had our first Sunday, now in, in California, they would use this program. It was called Phones for You. You know, all these programs that they come up with, right? They probably paid a lot of money for this, too. You know. it was, in, in California, they would start churches with 200 people for a Sunday. California. This is in California. <laughs> so our first Sunday, to me, I'm going to make a long story short. I don't want to ramble on. But our first Sunday, we had about 20 people there. And a lot of them were just like, my family members. I think there was only about four or five people there from the actual phone call. So I, I, I thought to myself, I said, this, is, this, is, this isn't looking good. So after, after the service, our overseer at that time was a guy named Brother Davis. He was there with his wife and his son. And afterwards, he took us out to eat. And while this was going on, 
Rose starts like coughing. I'm coughing. My wife. I don't think much of it. So we went out to eat, and I'm thinking inside myself, I'm thinking, this is, this is bad. This isn't going to work. So uh, we, you know, ate, and we went home. I remember that night, I was scheduled to speak over Trenum. Pastor Spencer invited me to speak at their Sunday evening service. So she was coughing and hacking. I said, boy, I said, you don't sound good. So uh, she said, I'm staying home tonight. I said, okay. So I went over there, and I got this feeling in my stomach. I said, this isn't working. So uh, anyway, long, again, I keep saying long story short, but I'm making it longer. Uh, she ends up in the hospital with pneumonia. When we used to have a hospital in New Kensington, she ended up at Citizens General. I took her down there the next day, and she was coughing. She was really sick, and she was down there like all week. And uh, I went the second Sunday to Garden City Fire Hall, which is where we were having service, and I had two people <laughs> and me. And the two people that I had were people that moved here from California, honest to goodness. <laughs> Uh, too bad we didn't call more people to move from California. <laughs> brother, brother Bill Snyder and uh, Sister Mercy Denton, two really nice people. Anyway, so I'm sitting there, and I, 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 you guys have heard this story. I, with these two people in front of me, and I'm sitting there, I got my guitar. You know. I'm thinking like, boy, this is dumb. <laughs> so uh, we, we, had, sir, we had church. I, I had a message. I preached the message, and we had church, and we prayed. And... and I, I, I left there, and I'm going to the hospital because Rose was going to be discharged. That's, that was a Sunday morning. She was going to be discharged. She was, okay. And I'm driving, and, and I've said this. You can, you can work up a pretty good heat from Monroeville to New Kensington. Because I'm sitting there driving, and I'm telling myself, I'm thinking, that was the dumbest thing you've ever done. I'm gonna, when I get home, I'm going to call the overseer, and I'm going to tell him this is just stupid. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm, I got a job. I, got, I don't need it. So... I, I went to the hospital <laughs> to pick her up, and she wasn't ready to leave yet. They didn't have her ready to go yet. And uh, I went up there, and I was just miserable. I was just, if you know me, I, I know how to be miserable. Right? <laughs> and uh, and uh, she was kind of like all happy because she was going home. And she, was, and she said, how'd it go? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know. So uh, they, they weren't ready to let her go yet. So she says, why don't you go get something to eat? You know, go get a sandwich. I said, okay. So I went down to the subway that used to be by where the WGBN is. There used to be a subway in there. I walked up to there, and I ordered a sub, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, I'm just as miserable as I can be. I, I really am. I just the dumbest thing in the world. Whoever told you? you could mm -hmm. And I've, I've said this story, and I don't, I don't make things up, and I'm, I'm just not the kind of person to make up stories, but I was sitting there. I mean, I was going out of my way to make myself as miserable as I could be. Anybody ever been there? You know how to, you know how to do that, right? And, and, and God spoke to me. And it wasn't like a, a voice, but it was, you know, like an audible voice. But he just said, look, it's not your church. Just shut up. It's not your church. So I, I listened to that, and I was like, and he said it again. And it was like he lifted that off of me. I didn't want to be happy. I wanted to be miserable. I just thought it was, a, but he like lift. That's why I didn't know it was the Lord because it sure wasn't me. And he was a, he lifted off me. So from that point on, and again, just uh, we were we were in that place for about a year in Monroeville, and uh, we had some. We, a few folks started coming. I remember the first time I, I was in double digits. I was just in heaven. Wow, man, I got ten today. But uh, we moved over to Harmerville in the hotel, which is now. The Clarium used to be the Holiday Inn, the, the first one when you get there. And we met there for about three or four years, I guess, until this building came open. This used to be uh, Bible Way, and they built a place down in downtown. And we found out this was open. And uh, I talked to Pastor Mitch, and he said they would rent it to us, this building. And uh, I, I told my folks, I said, listen, I said, we could stay at this hotel. It was just like the, the three lepers in the story in the Old Testament. When they were, they were starving inside the wall, and they said, well, we could stay here and die. We could go inside and die, or we can go over here and see what happens. So, so I told my folks, I says, well, we can go, because our, our expenses were going to, like, triple, you know, because you got gas and electric. When you meet in a hotel, you pay a monthly fee, and that's it. But anyway, we, we came here, and eventually, after a few years, you know, we bought the place, and here we are. Uh, and uh, there's a lot more stories I could tell you, but I won't, I won't bore you with that. Instead, I'd like to look at God's word because the one thing 
that has always been my heart. Even, you know, and, and I'll, I'll say this, I didn't have a burden from, from Monroeville. I didn't, you know, and, and it's one of those things where you, you, we did it backwards. You're supposed to get a burden, then go. But they sent me. I didn't have a burden for Monroeville. I didn't have a burden for Harmerville because, I mean, there was nothing in Harmerville except a bunch of hotels and fast food restaurants. But when we got in here, and I just live a block away, when we got here, God began to unveil and God, God began to show the purpose. And the burden began to grow. And that's where we're here right now. We're here. This is where God wants us to be. Uh, but I believe that with all my heart. And we have a, a reason and a purpose for being here. Just look around when you come and go. Just look around. We were talking about this uh, uh, Friday evening about the kids that come and go. I had mentioned to Sister Casey and a few other ones. I said, what... God, what is the, and, and the word I've been hearing a lot lately is the word strategy. And what do, what do we need to do to reach these kids? Because they don't, a lot of them, maybe, maybe went to church at one time, maybe their parents dragged them to Sunday school, who knows. Wherever they're at, is God able to save this generation? Of course he is. Now, Lord, where do we fit in to that picture? How do we get them in? And once we get them in, what are we going to do with them? You know, and that's kind of where we're praying right now. What, you know, and not just the kids, because every one of us knows somebody in our family. Everybody, every one of us knows somebody in the neighborhood, somebody we work with that needs to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, give us the strategy. That's the word I've been hearing. What? And I'm not talking about trying to trick him in. You know, I'm not trying to, how to sneak him in. But, what, Lord, how can we minister your love? Holy Spirit, how can you move through us to touch these people where they're at and show them the love and the mercy of Jesus Christ who forgives all our sins, cleanses us from all our iniquities. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And we're all reading this, working up to where we want to be. He says this, There is one body, People will say, look at all these churches around here. There's a lot of churches. Some of them are filled up. Some of them are empty. Some of them are spirit-filled. Some of them are just... And there's all these churches, and people will say, well, what church do you go to? I go to Pastor Carmen's church. I go to Pastor Mitch's church. I go to... There's only one body. We're a part of that body. We're a congregation within that. But there's only one body. There's only one church. It's the body of Christ. And whenever the body of Christ grows, we all benefit. Whether it be Pastor Rogers' church, if his body grows, we benefit because we're part of the body. If it's Pastor Lovey or Pastor Mitch or any, any of the other good pastors that's preaching God's word, I'm not talking about the ones who are out there just floating along. I'm talking about there are churches where God's word is preached, where the name of Jesus is lifted up. They're preaching salvation. They're preaching the gospel. They're preaching the blood of Jesus Christ. Whenever the body of Christ is increased, we all benefit. See, so this is why, I, you know, I love to see people come to church, but if somebody comes here and they don't like it, I'll, I'll tell them some other church they can go to. Where I know the gospel is being preached. He says, there's one body and one Holy Spirit. There's not a bunch of different Holy Spirit. It's not a different Holy Spirit in the Methodist Church and the Presbyterian Church and the Pentecostal Church. There's only one Holy Spirit. We think, you know, ours is different than everybody else. There's only one body. 
There's one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. One Father, one Son, one Spirit. God is the same. He was the same a million years ago. He's the same now. He doesn't change. And the same God that's here is the same God that's in every congregation that's preaching God's Word. It's the same Spirit, same God, same, same Jesus. The same blood on Calvary that saved me saved anybody else. If you're saved by the blood of Jesus, there's no other way. The Jesus has saved me. It's the same Jesus that saved you or the ones over here or over there. Okay? Now listen. There's one body, one Lord, one God, verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. I'm glad we're not all the same. If everybody were like me, we'd probably end up killing each other. <laughs> until one was left. And you can put your name in that. You can fill the blank in there with you. We're all different individuals. In this building, there's maybe 50, 60 people here. We're all different. Everybody has different personality, different background, different upbringing, different likes, different dislikes, blah, blah, blah. But we all worship the same Jesus. And this isn't wonderful that Jesus doesn't demand us to become a clone of everybody else. When I first started, you know, in ministry, okay, Rose and I, they would, we had to go to internship, okay, and they would give you books to read about how to, you know, anyway. and there were some pretty good suggestions and things in there, but I found out that there's no, there's no plan, there's no formula, just like dealing with people. One on one on one. We can't deal with everybody according to the way everybody else is. There's no plan. There's no formula. We have to deal with one another as individuals. Because everybody's different. We're one God, one Lord, one Spirit, one body, made up of all different kinds of people. Different people. And to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. We're all given different gifts. We're all given different callings. We're all given, given different abilities, some more than others. But we all have a place and a purpose in the body of Christ. Now, he says in verse 8, Wherefore he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up above the heavens, that he might fill all things. He's talking about when Jesus gave up the ghost on the cross and said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. We believe that for those three days, what Jesus did was in the spirit, his body was buried, but his spirit descended into the grave, the place that we call hell. But when we, when we think of hell, we think of fire and brimstone and so forth. But before the cross, hell wasn't like that. Hell had a place of, a place of torment and a place called Abraham's bosom. The righteous, the righteous dead before the cross could not go into the presence of the Father because the blood had not been shed. So God prepared a place for them. Jesus talks about it in Luke uh, chapter 16 when he talks about Abraham's bosom, paradise, okay? But when Jesus died, what he did was he presented his blood to the Father. He went down, and all those righteous dead that were in paradise, he said, come with me, boy. It's time to go to your eternal home with the Father. The, the suffering are still there waiting for the great white throne judgment. But he descended, and he asked them, okay, now that's just a little parenthesis in there, but uh, it's talking about giving gifts. Now look what he says in verse 11. We're getting to where I want to get. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Gifts in the body of Christ. Callings and ministries in the body of Christ. Now all of us are called to be witnesses. If you're a believer. If you're not a believer, then this really doesn't apply to you. 
If you're a believer in Christ, you're called to be witnesses. We're all called to be witnesses. But within the body, he has established different offices and gifts to operate, to run the body. Now, the first one he mentions is the office of apostle. Some people believe that apostles aren't around anymore. They believe that the apostles were the first century, uh, the ones who wrote the scriptures and so forth. And those apostles really had a very special kind of calling and a gift. But in fact, in the body of Christ, it's still the body of Christ, we need apostles. Apostles are leaders. Friday evening we had Brother Bell here. He, he serves an apostolic office within the organization that we're involved with. He's, he's an apostle. He's a leader. He's responsible and he's accountable. Because that's what really leadership is about. You're accountable to somebody and you're responsible for somebody. Okay? So he's an apostle. There are apostles. There are some people who claim to be apostles, but I have to put a big question mark. Who made you an apostle? <laughs> okay. As an apostolic. If they claim to be apostles. I, you know, well, okay, you claim to be an apostle. I know Brother Bell is because I, I know him and I know where he comes from. All right? Don't believe. Just because somebody says they're an apostle, don't that's an apostle, don't believe they're an apostle. Look at their credentials. And that doesn't mean what church they belong to. Look at where they come from. Because you know what? Apostles, see, the apostles today think that they've got to live in a penthouse. But if you read about the apostles in the New Testament, they didn't stay in a penthouse. Matter of fact, the apostle Paul said, and I'm not going to preach on apostles, the apostle Paul said that they were at the end of the prey. They were, they were the worst treated. Because in Christ's body, the higher you want to be, the lower you're going to be. You hear what I'm saying? If you want to, if you want to be used by Jesus, if you want to give, you better be prepared to be knocked down a few pegs. Because if, you, if you're way up here and you call yourself an apostle, well, you'll just get all the glory. And God's not going to let that happen. We've been talking about Jacob in a, our studies in Genesis. How God got to, before he could give him a new name, or at the same time he gave him a new name, he gave him a lamp. Somebody said, and I forget who it was, they said, watch out for any Christian leader that doesn't walk with a lamp. Okay? If you're an apostle. You have to have been through something. God had to have brought you through something. If you're going to be a leader in his church, that's an apostle. He said, he gave some apostles, and he gave some prophets. There are those people who are called to be used by God to speak his word in due season. Not necessarily telling, you know, future things, but speaking God's word. We, there are folks that operate in prophetic. That they'll, you know, God will move upon them, the Spirit will move on, and they'll, they'll give a word to the church. Sometimes a personal word it might be, whatever it might be. There are those who are gifted in that area. I've, I've not been gifted to be a prophet. God has used me in that area once or twice, but not, that's not, I'm not a prophet. And some evangelists, the evangelists are the ones that will go from place to place, like our, our friend Pastor Malie, and, and stir people up and light a fire and get people uh, just moving, you know, get people moving. Evangelists. And then, some pastors and teachers. Now, I've got to put my hand up there. He didn't call me to be an apostle. I'm not, I don't want to be an overseer. I'm not a prophet. I'm not an evangelist. God did not call me to go to Africa or India. I'd like to sometime. I, you know, in my flesh, somebody said, wouldn't you like to go to Africa? I said, I'd love to go to Africa, but God has not told me to go to Africa. I had a fellow I was corresponding with for a long time, and I don't know what happened to him. He was in India. We would have email back and forth. He kept saying, come over to India, come over to India. And I, I used to say, Rosa, I used to say, Rosa, you want to go to India? She said, no. <laughs> But pastor, teacher, most, you know, if you go to churches, and some of the, some of the brothers that I know that are pastors, pa that's, that's an office. That's a place. Now, God has called me, and you might disagree, and that's okay if you want to. He's called me to be a pastor and a teacher. Sometimes I've got to put a question mark on that one, too. Sometimes I say, Lord, why did you ask me to do this? Because sometimes it's hard. You know, as I said right now, Pastor Malie, he's the chaplain of the FOP. He has to deal 
with these police officers and his family as the chaplain to them because they lost one of their fellow soldiers. And it's hard. Listen to what he says. He gave all these gifts. Now, now this is where we're getting to. Verse 12. Why? Why do we have these? Why do we have church? Why do we have apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers, prophets? Why? Verse 12. For the perfecting or completing of the saints. I've said this before, and it's, it's been kind of my mantra. I, I hope and pray that anybody that walks in this building and hears preaching from me or anybody else, when they leave, they're going to know something they didn't know before. They're going to be, if, if they're not saved, that they'll become saved. And if they are saved, they'll grab a hold of something, maybe a spiritual something, some piece of knowledge, whatever it might be, that's going to make them a little bit more like Jesus Christ. Because that's what this is all about, perfecting us or completing us, conforming us to the image of Jesus. That's, that's what's supposed to be going on in the body of Christ. And for every individual, we're all different, we're all different levels, we all come from different places. For every individual, we're, we're at a different level, but it's always for the purpose of getting us a little more like Him. The perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry or the work of service. The body of Christ, any body of Christ, any congregation needs to be service-oriented, outreaching. What happens, and again, as, as Brother Bell was sharing, a lot of churches, they get to that place, that instead of being outreaching, they're more concerned with maintaining you know, the, the mechanism inside the church instead of going out and reaching those people who are lost. When you get to that point, you begin to decline. When we get to the point where I start being more concerned about, about keeping this running than reaching the lost, when we as a congregation get more concerned about you know, keeping the programs, keeping the stuff going, than going out there reaching the lost, what will happen is it will start to decline. Because Jesus never meant for his church, for his body, to be a, a, a place that just meets in the building once or two, twice or three times a week and then goes home. It's always for the purpose of taking what we hear and hear, making it, completing us, giving us the understanding and the knowledge and the spiritual understanding to take it out there. Because that's what it's all about out there. We have fellowship. We assemble ourselves together. That's important. We pray for one another. We fellowship with one another. We encourage one another. That, those are important things. But it's all for the purpose of winning the law in our community, in our families. Listen. He says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and here we go, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. That's been our slogan in, in Monroeville, in Harmerville, in building the body. Not necessarily bringing more and more numbers and making this bigger and making this... If that happens, that's okay. But building the body of Christ, making people, making sure that everybody within the body somehow is every day gets a little more like Jesus, a little more conformed to his image, looks a little bit more like Christ. That should be our personal commitment for ourselves and for us to say, Lord, help me be a light in my generation. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the, of the body of Christ. Verse 13. Till we all come in unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You see, I grew up in a church where it was about the ritual. You went through the ritual. And by going through the ritual, there was some kind of a, a magical type thing imparted unto you. They wouldn't call it magical, but I would. And, and many of you grew up in the same way. And, 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 and sometimes, you know, people grow up in church. When I, when I go down to minister down in, uh, down in like Westmoreland County Jail, I always ask those guys, not always, but a lot of times I'll ask them, how many people here were raised in church? And almost every hand goes up. 
We've had, there, and this is, this is a fact, evangelical, Pentecostal churches are losing their kids. Kids raised up in Sunday school, ministry, and when they get old enough to leave the house, they're out the door. Why? Because we take for granted just because we bring them in that Christ is getting in them. We take it for granted. I've been there. Just figure, hey, sending the kids to Sunday school every Sunday. Got to be hearing something. Well, they hear a lot. But do they listen? You see, we, we take things for granted. I was thinking about in our nation, I've been reading a lot about uh, you know, the way things have happened. How, how did it get to the place where we had a Supreme Court that said you can't pray in school anymore? Was that just an overnight thing? My, Pastor Harold, again, my good friend, I always quote him. He says, erosion makes no noise. And we're seeing it happen in our, in our churches, in our congregations. But we just take it for granted. We come to church on Sunday, come to church Sunday night, come to church Wednesday night. And we hear the word. But what is happening on the inside? When we have the world screaming at us and our kids, screaming with all these flashing lights and all these other things that look and sound and feel so good. And we think, well, maybe we can imitate that. Maybe we can, we can take some of that and, and put Christ in it. Listen, the only thing that's going to save anybody is the preaching of the blood of Jesus and the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. I don't care what you can, you can try to attract them in. You can do what you want to do. But if they're not going to hear the gospel, if they're not going to hear the truth, if they're not going to hear about the blood, they'll just leave the same way they came in. You can give them a track. Hope they'll read it. And hope the Spirit will take something in and give it to them. Because unless God draws them, unless the Father draws them. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the, full, of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. Man, church, we've we got to grow up. The preaching of God's Word should make us mature. But sometimes we get so caught up, and it, listen, don't, don't think it doesn't happen with ministry. <laughs> it happens. I've seen some of them. They get so caught up in their own calling and their own, their own ministry and their own this and that that they forget why God called them to that ministry in the first place. That we be henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. I'll tell you what. The preachers can, can throw some of the worst tantrums you've ever seen. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But what? Speaking the truth in love. See, the problem is a lot of folks want to speak the truth, but they don't want to do it in love. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, a lot of folks, they want to be right. Got to be right. But we need to speak the truth in love. Speaking in the truth, speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. You see, our, our, my, my, my vision, because we were talking about vision the other night, is to see equipped Christians. We're all different. You can't give somebody a, a plan and say, do it like this, because we're all different. We all have different personalities. We all have different strengths. We all have different weaknesses. It doesn't matter. There is no plan. If, if the Holy Spirit's dwelling inside of you, He'll give you the plan. He'll use you where you are, who you are, with your personality, with your abilities, with your talents. He'll use whatever He has given you to reach out to the people that need to hear God's Word. That's been my heart. From the very beginning. Even when I didn't have a burden for Monroeville. I didn't say, oh, God save Monroeville. Oh, God save Monroeville. Oh. I had no burden for Monroeville. I had no burden for Harmerville. Oh, God save Harmerville. Save Harmerville. 
But then we got here. In my neighborhood. And I said, God, save my neighborhood. I'm not moving. Some folks said, when I used to work over Allegheny Love, them, them guys over there used to say, why don't you move out of Arnold? What are you doing living in Arnold? Why am Arnold? So I'm not moving anywhere. I want to throw the devil out. I want to make him move. I'm, the crack dealers in my neighborhood, I either want to see them get saved or get out. I'd rather see him get saved. The kids that hang out on the steps. Fell across the street. He says, well, he says, them kids were hanging out on your steps. He says, you ought, to, you ought to yell at them. Get them off them steps. He said, if I yell at them, they'll probably just come back and paint someone. <laughs> huh. I'm going to yell at them. I'm going to invite them to come in. I'll give them a track. I say, God bless you. I'll pray with them. Because they need, to, they, need to, they need to see the love of Jesus. They could be out there selling dope. I know they're rolling blunts. I've seen, I've seen it on the front. The, the, I, know, I know what they're doing out there. That's okay. Lord, what will it take? God, help us be complete in Christ mature, willing, and ready to share our faith with anybody who wants to hear it. Because they need Jesus. They need Christ. They need Christ. I've, I've, I've told this story. I'm going to close. A few months ago, I was downstairs, and I heard some ruckus out back, and I went out and looked, and there were two kids carrying a flat screen TV down the, down the aisle. So I called 911, and uh, they, they got the kids later, and the TV was gone, but one of them had a bunch of marijuana on them. So they must have swapped the TV first. Okay. So I had to go to the hearing down at the magistrate's office. I've, most of you have heard this story, so I'll make it quick. Down, down at the magistrate's office, I went down to a hearing to testify, and what I saw and there was a woman sitting across the room, and, it was, and I, I heard her speak. There was her and another younger girl, and it was like his mother and girlfriend sitting there. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm sitting here, I'm thinking like, you know, I mean, this, this woman might want to, like, stab me, I, you know, because I turn her kid. But they, they eventually the, the, the case was waived to court, so we didn't have the hearing then. But I went over to her, and I said, ma'am, I says, uh, I'm praying for your son. And she looked at me. She started crying. She started crying. And I said, you know what? I said, he needs Jesus. 18-year-old boy looking at a couple years in jail for drugs and for a thief. I said, he needs Christ. We all need Jesus. They need Jesus. The ones that sit on the steps need Christ. The ones that walk up and down the street need Christ. The ones that are selling drugs in your neighborhood, they need Christ. The ones, that, the, the, the ones who are shooting around the corner, all this other, they need Christ. And we have Christ. We need to find out how we can get it to them. That's what I want to be about. I didn't have a burden for Monroeville. And I didn't have a burden for Harmerville. But when I got here, God began to give me a burden for this town I live in. Someday he might call me to go somewhere else. Maybe. I don't know. Someday he might take me home. Well, I know someday he's going to take me home. I don't know when. <laughs> Unless the rapture happens. But as long as I'm here, I want us to be a difference right here. What can we do? I thank God for the young folks we got coming here. What can we do? Where can we? Lord, give us the strategy to reach them. We know we, 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 we have what they need. We have Christ. But how do we get it to them? What will, Lord, the, the power of your spirit to draw them in? 
What will it take? I don't want to just come here and have church on Sunday morning. I like doing that. That's good. We get together. We have church and we praise the Lord and clap and hear from Him. But I'm not going to be satisfied with that. When there are people in these neighborhoods who are drug addicts, who are drug dealers, when there are children in these neighborhoods that, that their parents are never around, whatever is gone, when there, when there are people who are struggling, God, what, what effect can we have, the body of Christ, what effect can we have in this neighborhood? That's my prayer. And I hope you all have that prayer too. I, I'm thankful for you. Some of you have been here, come here for a long time. Some of you are just fairly new. I'm thankful for every one of you. And I'm just praying and believing, God, you have a purpose for us being here. We thank you, Lord, for 20 years. We thank you, Lord, for some of the memories that we've had. And all the people who have come through our doors, some have gone on to be with you. Some have moved on to different places. But, Father, my prayer this morning, as we look back and we're thankful for 20 years, Father, we're looking to tomorrow. We're looking to this week, to next week, to next month, to next year, Father. What and where will you have us go? What and where will you have us say? What and where will you have us do, Father? We want to be listening with your ears and seeing with your eyes. We want to be sensitive to the leading of your Holy Spirit that we might be able to minister the grace and the love of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying and perverted world. They've thrown you out of school. They're trying to throw you out of government. But, Father, they're not going to throw you out of 216 Catalpa Street. They're not going to throw you out of New Kensington, Father. My prayer is not only for us, but for every man of God that's in this city preaching your word and reaching out to the lost, Father. I pray that the body of Christ would be increased in New Kensington and Arnold and Lower Borough and this community. Father, I pray that the body of Christ would be increased through the preaching and teaching of your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Won't you stand with me as we close our service? That's our vision. That's our mission. That's why we're here. I hope that's why you're here. Thank you, Lord. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking. We're going to close our service as, as always. If you need prayer, please kind of come up here and sit. I go back and shake some hands and I come back in. If you need prayer for anything, please don't leave. Uh, whatever it might be. Okay? But we want to send you all with thanks and with a hope God uses for your glory. Tell somebody about Jesus this week. On Christ the solid rock I stand.